Good morning. There's something different in the spirit this morning. God has been up to some things. In fact, this morning, right as we were ending just singing, God gave me a prophetic word, and I wanted to wait until the tape was going. One of the things that has happened in the last several generations How many know that when Jesus died, the Bible says the the veil rent? That the separating veil between God and man was rent. And how many know, aren't you glad that happened because of the cross of Christ? But the last several generations, what man has done in institutionalized religion is we have built our own veil with concepts of God that our flesh could accommodate. Uh, I read a uh, short article, there was a link to it on Facebook this week by Ray Comfort, and he said one of the questions that he's always asked is, how can an all-loving, all-forgiving God send people to hell? How many of you ever heard that response? He said, well, first of all, the Word of God does not say that God is all-loving and all-forgiving. What you've done is you've made an idol that you've worshipped instead of the living God. Because there's only one thing that God is supremely, and that is holy. And that holiness required him to come in our behest and die on a cross in a death that is unbelievable, all because he loved us and his justice required that. And what we have done, we we have had so many different versions of Jesus and so many different understandings of grace that are counter to the full counsel of God's word that what, what has happened is we have replaced the veil that Jesus ran on the cross and God has just about had enough of it. And what he said this morning is you, many, many of my people that have gone on with me and done great things have simply seen a glimpse through the veil of man-made traditions and lies that they say are my word. And God is saying, I'm getting ready to rent the veil once again. And I say, let it be so, Lord Jesus. One of the things that has been really kind of just stirring in me uh, as we're doing this series, and it's stirring in me because there are, there are so many concepts. Even what I've dealt with so far in First John is just really scratching the surface of what's going on. We need to understand the Antichrist. We need to understand all these things. But we also need to understand the dynamic of fellowship with God. We're getting ready to enter into a time that we're going to see miracles again. I believe there are ebbs and flows in the kingdom of God. And if you've ever seen uh, the, the last tsunami that they had, that they were able to have had people with cell phones and stuff that were filming it, do you ever notice how the water just receded all the way back to all of a sudden you saw parts of the beach no one had ever seen before, before the big waves came? We have had that in the spirit. We have went through a period. You very rarely hear of miracles anymore. Not real miracles. You don't really hear of hardly real visitations of God. When, when older preachers do it, sometimes they're drawing back from what they saw in the 60s, 70s, and 80s to share stories to try to inspire us. What we have not realized is before that last great wave of God can come, it has to draw back off of the shore just like a tsunami. And so there are ebbs and flows to the things of the kingdom of God. And as much as he has drawn back, he's getting ready to come. And I want all of us to be ready. I'm ready for a tsunami of the Holy Ghost. I'm ready for a tsunami of the power of God. And there's some things strategic in 1 John that he shares. And one of the things that God put in my spirit is the three words that he kept on saying to me were fellowship, overcoming, and changing the world. Fellowship, and they have to go in this order. You have to have fellowship before you can overcome. And you have to overcome before you can change the world. And so I want to deal this morning. I thought, well, that that sounds great. That'll be just one perfect sermon. No, it isn't. I just got to point one this morning. I kept on typing and typing and typing, and I got to page five, and I thought, you know what? 
We're going to go past dinner if I'm not careful. And so I'm just going to stop right here with this. But I want to go again to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. And it says, that which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And what I want to center in this morning is fellowship. You see, we don't understand fellowship anymore. In fact, after all the years that Mary and I have been married, now we'll be the first to tell you that when we first got married, our marriage sucked like a hoover. I guess today, today's saying it sucked like a Dyson, and it just wouldn't quit sucking. I mean, it was horrible. But God has done something along the way, and along the way, we, we begin establishing fellowship. And that fellowship became a good marriage. Now, there's still more depths to the fellowship. I think we're finding that out as, as we grow older. But the last hundred years or so, for all of us, we've all become disconnected we are disconnected, techocentric, people using people. That that is the that is the way of the world today. In fact, what used to be in the workforce, when you were brought in, you were mentored because you became there was a relationship that formed between you and the owner. He cared about you, you cared about him. He began to see to it that you had the training in life to excel in all areas of life, and out of that there came a loyalty that you were willing to sacrifice for him because he was willing to sacrifice for you. That's forever gone in the corporate world. Now what 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 is the very term that we use? Well, if, when, you, when you go and you work for a business, the first thing you got to head to is human resources. You've become, you're not a person anymore. There's not this relationship. There's not this mentoring. There's not this fellowship anymore. You're just simply a resource. And see, a resource is utilized with whatever the best fit it needs to be. And then when it is used up, it is disregarded for a new resource. It's the way of Babylon. Go and, and Google on, 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 go on the internet and Google about the EU's uh, symbol that they brought out when they, when they did the, when they were forming the EU, they did a Tower of Babel. And if you look, all the people are bricks. Everybody is simply a resource and they're interchangeable. You're a resource, you're nothing more than a battery. That's the way the government looks at you. That's the way the elite look at you. That's the way everybody looks at you except for Almighty God. The Bible says we're being built into a holy place. We're being built into an altar of God. And if you understand the concepts of Torah, you can only use stones that have never been hewned. God made you a certain way, and there's a perfect place for you. You're, you're not a resource. It's out of that fellowship that you become established in the kingdom of God and you discover yourself. How many of you have ever seen people go on, on, on self-discoveries? You can't discover yourself until God helps you learn who you are. It's only through that fellowship and that intimacy with him. The bad thing is we have done the same concept with God. Jesus has called us into fellowship with the Father. He has brought us into fellowship with the Father by the power of the cross, by the power of his blood. And what we have done is we have gone from fellowship, like everything else, we have gone to resource. I want a God who meets my needs. This must be an all-forgiving God because he's got to put up with me. He's got to be an all-loving God that requires nothing of me, but that I can constantly draw from. You see, I'm just a little Duracell battery, but I want this dynamo, this, this supernatural spiritual force that can energize and charge everything that I need. And if this one don't do it, I'll go to a church that preaches one that will. That is not fellowship with God. Let me tell you something. When you start walking with God, God will mess you up. He'll mess you up. He will show you your old ugly self and how that you need a Savior. And after you get saved, the Holy Spirit begins to systematically bring up areas of your life that you need to deal with to get rid of the ugliness, and you can't get rid of what you won't look at. That's one of the reasons God will mess you up. But he's got to mess you up to build you up. 
there's a Jeremiah principle. You've got to tear down some things before you can build some things. And that's exactly what God wants to do with this fellowship that we're doing with him. With what's going on today, the Holy Spirit said this. Mike, he said, I want to welcome you to the apostate church. The apostate church of resources. Because God does nothing more than a resource to them to build up something. When you come in the door, you're a resource. You're perfect for the bus ministry that we've, oh, we've been needing. Oh, you love babies. We, we, we have a perfect nurse ministry. We got this, we got that. You're nothing but a resource to build something up. And don't, for, and don't forget the tithe because that's a resource. And we're going to make you feel welcome because you have a place in our brick wall. See, one of the thing, one of the reasons I don't require a lot about with you guys with what we're doing here is it's about building the family. It's about building yourself. And once you get walking with God right, anything you're supposed to do in the kingdom will come as easy as breathing, and it is as unique as creation itself. I am not building a brick wall at biblical life. I want you to build a family in your uniqueness in the way that God enables you to see things once you're free and free of sin. You will you have a unique perspective on the personality that God gave you once it's free. And let me tell you something, our, our personalities can be diverse. But when they're free from demonic influence, they're wonderful, they're insightful, and each one of us combined can see an aspect of God that nobody else can. We have got to stop viewing God as a resource because we need to understand he never views us that way. He views angels that way, but he doesn't view us that way. An angel is a resource sent to, to minister to heirs of salvation. But we're family. I want to look at this Greek word kononia in, in the Greek that's translated as fellowship. It means fellowship, association, community, joint, participation, and intimacy. God wants to get intimate with you. Now, in this day and this age, one of the biggest problems that we have is we really don't get intimate with anybody, to include ourselves. The ones that we lie to the most is ourselves. We try to hide everything by piling it into the psychic closet behind us in our mind and closing the door and says it don't reason and we begin believing our own PR. Has anybody ever seen a, a politician or a or a movie star believe in their own PR? They put on these personas and have you ever seen two movie stars in a movie together and they fall in love with a persona that they were acting like they were while they were and they fell in love with each other, they fell in love with the personas, but after they after they got the movie quits about a year later they the the thing falls apart because the persona is let down. What the Holy Spirit says, I want to introduce you to yourself so that I can redeem you so that you can get to know who I am in you and who you have become in me. And once you, uh, Because you've got to connect with yourself before you can connect with God. So that we, we, we have become shallow all the way. We're shallow with ourselves. We're shallow with each other. And right now the way the world works is the guy who can be the most shallow but do the best persona is the guy who wins. It's the way of Babylon. God is calling us to step out of that because he's calling us into fellowship. You see, in true fellowship, it's always a win-win situation. Now, what, what, what is unbelievable, you, know, you, you get to know God and really get to know him, you're deeply enriched. He changes you. He takes all the bad stuff, gets you to overcome it, enhances all the good stuff, and causes you to become that which you could only be through him, which is so much better than, than you 1.0. How I many know 2.0 is always better than 1.0? And God's wanting to take us to the new version of you, the better version, the redeemed version that knows him, that knows the kingdom, that knows your purpose, that knows his power. He wants to get you there, but he's got to introduce you to 1.0 first, and you've got to really see him with an, un, with an unveiled face so that you can really have a relationship with God that's just real. 
I mean, God knows my failings. God knows the lazy tendencies that I have in some areas. God knows that I can also get too focused on one thing. He, he knows all my pitfalls. And so the Holy Spirit begins working with me. But what, one of the things that's hard for me to understand is out of this relationship, God receives something too. His heart longs for real fellowship. Somebody that will really, really just share his heart or her heart with God and really get to know him. Somehow or another, God has chosen, although God is complete in himself and doesn't need anything, he has chosen to need that from us. So you know, God doesn't need your worship. But he knows that in that worship, there's a connection there that changes heaven and it changes us. And when we don't do it, we're the ones that suffer, not God. One of the things that God showed me, we, we sang that one song, Just As I Am. You know, I can come into your presence just as I am. The thing is, the moment you really come into his presence and you embrace Jesus, you change. The finiteness of man cannot connect to the infiniteness of God without there being a radical change. And the more that I embrace him, the more that I get to know him, the more I change because I'm coming in contact to that which is perfect, that which is holy, that which is unchangeable, that which is absolutely eternal. You see, we're getting ready to tap into some things as a body. We're getting ready to tap into some things. Uh, the true remnant church, we're getting ready to tap into some things. If we'll press into God and, and quit trying to build up this veil over our own eyes concerning us and him, God is going to do some radical things on the inside of us to empower us for the days ahead. You see, we're going to need to see miracles. It's not going to be a novelty. Boy, if I could just get a miracle going, boy, we can really get a church going is, is the attitude in, in most churches today. This is for me to accomplish what I need on planet earth and to survive the tsunami of the antichrist spirit that is also coming I have got to have the miraculous power of God I've got to move in the glory of God I've got to move in the anointing of God I've got to move in all these things so God is doing it for us now first of all we are brought into fellowship with Jesus how many know Jesus knows exactly right where you are? Hebrews 4 and 15 says, For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tested like we are yet without sin. So every temptation that you could ever imagine in your life, all the, how many know that there, there were times, do you know Jesus had a bad day? Do you know that? The Bible says that he heard that his cousin John had been murdered by Herod, and he went out to be alone. Do you ever just have enough of everything and just want to just leave me alone? I've got to work through my issues. <laughs> no, nobody here ever have issues. You just want to. You've just had enough of the world, had enough of all, everybody, and just wanted to get away. And so he's wanting to get away. He wants to pray. He wants to to just get through this hurt. And the people just keep on coming to him again, and they won't quit. And the Bible says he's moved with compassion, sets his own needs aside, where he could have been really selfish, because in that situation he could have done one of two things. Did you hear what just happened? Just go to your homes. Just leave me alone. I want to have some peace. Can't I have five minutes by myself? He could have said that. Or he could have said, you know what? I am Messiah. And I'm getting ready to open me up a can of whoop, Herod. And I tell you what, we're going to go and we're going to burn that thing to the ground. Because I have had about enough. That man's sin, he put John in jail because he cried out against his sin. And then because of his sinfulness, he killed him. And he would have had every right in the natural to do it. He chose not to do either one. But cho chose to be moved by the Holy Spirit, to move the compassion to help your needs. So he understands everything that we go through. And he said, listen, I've been there, I've done that. But I have not bought the t-shirt because I chose to yet not sin. And so when I embrace him, he, he identifies with me. But then when I identify with him, he gives me the ability to overcome that sin. 
He also come to bring us into fellowship with the Father. John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then he goes on to say, if you had known me, you should, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now I'm going to get into a couple of things here in a minute out of the book of Daniel that we, we need to reexamine our, our attitude and understanding of God. It has been poisoned. It has been watered down. Somehow or another, we act that God is schizophrenic, that all of a sudden God flipped a switch and he became a hippie after he got past the end of Malachi. Yes, Jesus did wear sandals, but everybody wore sandals. There were no combat boots to wear. But he was not, he was not a love-in hippie type of guy. But yet we have made him that way. Oh, it's just okay. Oh, just do whatever you want to do. It's just okay. It is not okay. John wrote the gospel of John so that we might all believe, but go to Revelation to find out who Jesus really is. Because there's a correlation between him and the God that we see in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. I want you to go to Dan Daniel chapter 7 this morning, and I want to show you some things. Now, the proper term for what we understand God to be is called the Godhead. We, Catholic theology borrowed a term from paganism called Trinity. It's the same, yet it's different. This is where Jesus, or Jesus, nor Paul, nor anyone else in the Bible, if you would, if you would get your strong concordance out and look up Trinity, it doesn't exist. Paul said Godhead is the Hebraic concept. And we see the full Godhead in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments were as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Literally, the throne of God is a chariot. This is talking about the Ancient of Days. And a fiery stream issued forth from before him. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Thousands minister unto him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set and the books were opened. And beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. How many know the beast has, a, has his comeuppance coming? The beast of the book of Revelation, the Antichrist. And his body destroyed and give it to the burning fire as concerning the rest of the beast. They had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night vision and beheld one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of glory and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom of all, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." Now, the rabbis will tell you this. this now I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to correct 200 years of bad German theology because they were disconnected from the Hebraic heritage. The, I've, I've told you before about the book uh, called The Jewish Gospels, written by an Orthodox rabbi in Israel, one of the top rabbis in Israel. He proves the Messiahship of Jesus better than almost 2,000 years of Christian scholarship. We have the entire Godhead here. This is where the Apostle Paul drew the concept of the Godhead. We have the Ancient of Days, God the Father. This aspect of God is unknowable. And so even in Daniel's time, it was unknowable. I've already showed you how that Jesus was the Olive Tav in Genesis 1. He became Yahweh in the Yahweh Elohim uh, 
when God revealed himself that way, that in yod Hey vav Hey is encoded the mission and the purpose of Jesus himself. Yahweh is Jesus before he took on flesh. But there was an aspect of Almighty God that is unknowable, the Ancient of Days, the one who white raiment, white hair, and the fire of God would flow out from him. But Jesus said, I come that you might know the Father. We have been brought into intimate fellowship with an aspect of God that no Jew was able to have before the cross. Because the God of the Old Testament that we see, not the Ancient of Days, but yod heh vav heh Yahweh, is Jesus. In fact, to fully understand Jesus, you've got to take him as Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant, and Messiah ben David, the conquering king. You put him together, you see the whole Christ. You see all of Jesus. Jesus made the unknowableness of God known to those who truly enter into fellowship with him. Why? Have you read what Jesus looks like in the book of Revelation? His hair's white. He wears a white remnant from head to this one. Now he has a gold girdle on too because he has conquered. He's coming as the king. He looks just like the ancient of days, except he has, still has the nail prints in his hand. He has the nail prints in his feet. And now the crown of thorns has been replaced with a crown of gold. He is the full expression of the ancient of days. And when I get to know him that way, the power of God begins to flow. You can't tap into the relationship with that kind of God and not have his power and his glory and his miracles flow. There are several things here God had me absolutely underline and write in bright red so that I wouldn't forget. When we open ourselves up to true fellowship with God, God begins to expand our comprehension of him. Our biggest problem is our God is too small. Our God won't, will tolerate sin. How can a God who is thrice holy tolerate sin? You see, I'm not worried anymore about the mark of the beast. I'm worried about having God's mark upon me. And we see a type and shadow of that mark whenever the high priest would put the miter on, it would say across here in Hebrew, holiness unto the Lord. That's the mark that God wants on us. If you have that mark, you're never going to have to worry about the mark of the beasts. Because it's first an image within before it's an external thing without. When I understand the fire of God and the holiness of God and how that he came to change me and to make me like him, all of a sudden holiness takes a hold in my life. And when you begin walking holy, the power will flow. Well, Mike, what has been a lot of what we have seen in Christianity? Occultic power masquerading from another Jesus. Because it didn't, re guys, I was in the middle of what I thought was revival years ago in another town from here, but yet we had witches there. We had teenagers, and all of a sudden you had all these unwanted pregnancies before marriage. You had all these, how could you have the miracles of God and the things of God without the holiness of God expressed? If you have signs and wonders and no holiness and transformation in the lives of people, you're dealing with another Jesus and another God. You see, I'm not after miracles. I'm after the God, the true God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to know him. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 3.10, he said, I long to know him and the power of his resurrection and even to have fellowship with his suffering. I am willing to pay any price to know this God. And that's the opposite of what most Christianity is preaching today. God does, does not just want to give you a better life now. And how many know there, there are blessings for walking with God? But he's trying to equip you to rule and reign with him forever. It's time that we grow up. 
The second thing that we need to learn to have fellowship with is we need to have what I call fellowship with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the most precious and powerful substance in the universe. Did you know that blood speaks? The first blood that was shed in the book of Genesis, Abel's blood, began to cry out to God. And God came down and said, I heard Abel's blood crying out. What's up? The Bible says the life is in the blood. We heard uh, Henry Groover, and I, I encourage you guys, go on uh, uh, Google the Hagman and Hagman Report from June 5th. They were doing an inter- a three-hour radio show with Hagman and Hagman, with Henry Groover, and with Stephen Quayle. Awesome, awesome, awesome thing. One of the things, he's actually had men challenge him on this, pastors challenge him. He has walked over uh, many of the major cities of this planet. He has walked and prayed over them, re- asking God to forgive the sins. And when he gets into a major city, he can begin to hear babies cry from the gutters, from the sewer systems. And he'll follow it right back to an abortion clinic. And men of God basically have called him a liar. So they, they t- he doesn't know the city. They'll take him. And they just kind of go around. And they'll say, stop right here. I hear babies crying. Now you need to go up that way, three blocks, and it's over up here. And he would lead them to the largest abortion clinic in the city. There is power in blood. Occultists use, use blood to open up portals into other realms. There is power in blood. But none of them compare to the blood when Almighty God took human form and he had, that was eternal blood that was without sin that was shed for you and I. This blood can cleanse us from all sin. It brings us to a spiritual place to where you had never sinned. That's justification. That when I come under the blood of Jesus in the spirit realm, it's like I had never been touched by sin, but i got to learn to walk in that level of where the blood has brought me. It establishes me, it brings me into fellowship with the Ancient of Days. It also brings me into the most powerful covenant that exists in the universe, that I have been brought in fellowship with the Ancient of Days, that which is unknowable because he's so holy, he's so awesome, he's so powerful that all he had to do was speak and the entire universe came into existence, that blood brings me in the blood covenant with him. And blood covenant works this way, that everything I am and has now belongs to him and everything he has now belongs to me. That's blood covenant. That's why the apostle Paul talks about our divine inheritance that we have in the beloved. The power of God belongs to me as long as I'm walking in fellowship with that blood. And what does that mean? That I am walking to make sure that I don't do anything that that blood didn't empower in my life. I don't go back to the old ways of the old man that that blood freed me of, and I begin walking in what that blood has now made me. I stay in covenant with that blood. I love this one, and I, I started to write down one word, and God says, no, that's the wrong word. It disintegrates any claim the enemy can have upon your life and your soul. Once the blood gets there, that's part of the sanctification process. That when the Holy Spirit brings something up and I bring it under the blood of Jesus through repentance and application of the blood, it disintegrates. And what disintegrate means is it it is, it is tore down to the molecular level that it can never be assembled again. That's what disintegrate means. So here you have this demon that has this collar on you and this leash on you and says, I can make Mike just do anything that I want. Watch. He has this big old easy button, and I can make him do this, and I can make him do that. But the moment I come in that area of my life under the blood, the collar and the leash disintegrates, and he has no legal right to influence my life anymore. That's the power of the blood. That blood releases the power of the kingdom that is without end and dominion that is eternal. It begins to release that in my life. I've got to be blood dead. That's one of the reasons we take communion, to remember the blood and the body of Christ for us. And if his blood isn't empowering it, I'm not going to have a part of it. 
That's the way of Babylon if the blood's not there. And that's so crucial because whenever they anointed a priest, and every one of us are priests unto Almighty God, the, uh, the anointing, the true anointing of God could only be applied where the blood was applied. So the blood is the catalyst that brings in the anointing. The blood also drives back every demon of hell. They can't handle the blood. Come on now. To walk in fellowship in the blood of Christ is to live a life that is cognizant of what the blood can both do actively and has accomplished in our lives. We are to never step outside the cleansing power of that blood nor outside of the kingdom that it releases. Come on now. The third thing. We have got to enter back into fellowship with the word. We have become a wordless people. We have become people of sound bites. Sound bites and hype. We've got to move beyond that. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This word is living. A living God, a holy God, still speaks through this word. I remember seeing a cartoon the other day, and these people were saying, oh, God, please talk to us. Please talk to us. Please. We need to have a word. We need to have a word. And the next thing you see is this big hand coming out of the cloud, and there's a Bible. Everybody wants words from God, but they never want to get into the word of God. You're not going to receive anything additional to this until you start getting into this. Because if you receive words outside this word and don't know this word, you can be led anywhere. And I've seen a lot of crazy stuff over the years that did not line up with the character, the nature, or the Word of God, and people were calling it the Holy Spirit. It was a deceiving spirit, another spirit. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How many are tired of stumbling in the dark? You don't know what's coming. You don't know where to put your feet down. Have you ever been in situations that feel like no matter which way you went, it was wrong? I have. But I start getting into the word and allow the word to become a light to me. God can say, put your foot down right there, there's no landmine. Put your foot over there, there's no landmine. Step two steps to the left and take another step. The, the, that's why the apostle John talks about, I'm keeping the commandments of God. I first learned them. We're called to read the word. How many know that's, that's level one? Study the word. That's where you start connecting all the dots, digging in a lot deeper, finding out what the original Greek and Hebrew means, find out how it runs through the, the entire Bible. It, the, the, the miraculous thing about this book, guys, no other book, the Quran doesn't do this, the Book of Mormon doesn't do this, the, the writings of Confucius doesn't do this. You can take one theme, and even though you had all these different authors writing through 66 books, the way it is in the beginning is the way it is in the end. There is a continuity to the Word of God that flows perfectly from Genesis to Revelation. I've had people say, oh, God contradicts himself. No, he died. You're just as stupid. You won't study it out and find out what he really said. Can I just real put that bluntly? Because I am tired of people bearing false witness against my God. There is not one contradiction in the Word of God, but there's a lot of misinterpretations. Because you won't do your hermeneutical research and get back into a Hebraic mindset and find out what God has said. That's just another soapbox of mine. Psalms 19, 7 through 11. Listen to this. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's what James said. Receive you back with, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And the Psalms tells us exactly what it is, the Torah. And yet the church today, won't, is, for some reason, is scared of anything before Matthew. It's amazing to me. Now, how many, how many read the book of Acts and you just say, wow, I'd just love to walk in that. All they had was Genesis through Malachi and spent all their time in it and added Jesus to it. We look back at the book of Acts and say, oh, I just long for the good old days, but we won't go past Matthew and we can't produce it. 
So then we look for other crazy stuff to try to reproduce what should come naturally in the kingdom if we just meditate on God's law. If he who says he knows him keeps his commandments, and the commandments of God can convert the soul, not your spirit that took the cross, but once you're saved, it begins converting your soul where you start thinking as, as you're in the kingdom. And I love this next one because there's hope for me. And the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's Mike Lake right there. I've been made wise by the word of God, not anything that I've done because I started out simple and God made me wise as I got into the word. And the deeper I get, the smarter I get because the Holy Spirit begins to churn these things on the inside of me. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of God is pure, enlightening the eyes. Everybody's wanting enlightenment today. Even the church is running around looking for enlightenment. Get back into the Torah. It'll show you Jesus better than anything else. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they are than gold. Yea, than fine gold, sweeter than the honeycomb, or the honey and the honeycomb. There's nothing that the world can offer you that could ever replace when this word really starts working on you and in you and through you. All the gold in the world. Gold line can't give you what God's word can. You can have a stack of gold and lose it in an hour. Come on. I mean, everybody's trying to get ready for the tribulation. I mean, they're storing up food, storing up gold. Did you know there's already laws in the books that they can take every bit of that away? Legally, you're not allowed to have more than one month's supply in your home by federal law. Otherwise, they say you're hoarding. And that, that's just another way of socialism for them to take it away. But you know what? With God, you can find out how to get it back when there's none. Listen to me. You can find out how to get it back when there's none. Just like Henry Groover said, that three-year-old came up and said, the, the bird man or the angel came up and here's a big amount, wad of money for you that's going to last you, and then here's the tithe on it. How many know that heaven is still in the tithing? If the angel separated the tithe and said, make sure this is for the church, you give this to the church. <laughs> I, th I just thought that was interesting. It's like, Daddy, this one's for you. This one's for the church. And they counted it out, and it was the exact tithe. Powerful testimony. You can have ravens show up and bring you food. There's a time coming that your dry, freeze-dried food may all run out. The government may have, may have come and took it. And you bow your heads in reverence to God. You close your eyes and pray and give thanks. When you open up your eyes, there's food on your table. You can have a box of protein bars that just keep on giving. Because we serve that kind of God. That's why his stuff is better than this. And I love verse 11. Moreover by them your servant is warned. Why? Because I don't know really how to walk in this new kingdom. I'm used to walking in Babylon. But the minute I start walking in Babylonian ways... I'm done for. And right now on planet Earth, the only way really to get money and gold and all these different things is to walk in the ways of Babylon because they turn everybody to a resource. They use you, they abuse you, and then they spit you out when they're done. The kingdom is completely different. You become something that is cultured and something that is grown and, and loved and cherished and matured to grow into something powerful in the kingdom that's different. But sometimes there's not a lot of gold in that. There's not a lot of easy gold. You may have to have angels start bringing it to you. But that's better than the Babylonian way. You see, I'm wanting to learn the secret of Daniel. One of the secrets of Daniel is he had a prayer closet. And being a faithful Jew every day, he would pray twice. But when the king gave the decree that nobody could pray to anybody but him, he, he upped it to three. You see, when the pressure gets on, you don't back off a of prayer. You push into prayer. Three times a day. And he went out on his patio opened up, and opened up the sash to make sure everybody knew that he was praying. That's how you thrive in Babylon. It's your prayer life. It's getting back into the word of God. Because it goes on to say, and in keeping them, there is great reward. If you open this up in your Bible, underline great reward. This is a reward the IRS can't tax. 
Come on now. This is a reward nobody else can take away. If God produces a miracle in your life, is that taxable? Can they come and haul it off in a, in a truck? No, they can't. The world, since the world did not give it to you, the world can't take it away. It's of another kingdom. They don't have authority over it. Everything that is derived of this world, they have authority over and they can take, but they can't take the things of the kingdom. And I want some of that great reward. How many are getting happy in God this morning? I want to know this God. And part of our task that God is setting before us as we, as we continue on with this is God is calling us to begin to labor to increase our fellowship with him and with his word. Any marriage, guys, you have to work on the relationship. Now, you guys may be different than me, but part of, part of our process was Mike Lake had to learn Mike Lake before he could re- reveal Mike Lake to his wife. I didn't even really know who I was. But as, as God began to work on me, and I worked on myself, and then I could begin to work on this relationship with, with Mary, we had to work through some issues. There, there were some discussions. But you know what? It brought us closer. And my relationship with God is going to take work, W-O-R-E. Hey, it's going to take work. I may have to tell God that I'm madder than a hornet, and I just don't know who to be mad at right now, but I am mad. I just, I, I just know that it really shouldn't be him, but he's the only one that can understand, the only one I really got to talk to. And as I begin sharing that with him, out of that conflict and that, that praying through those issues, I am drawn closer into fellowship with God, and he's drawn closer into fellowship with me. There may be times you'd, you got to say, God, i got some issues in my past. I don't know why, why did this person abandon me. Why did this one do this? Why did this one do that? If I take it to him, he'll help me work through the issues to get me free of those things. And in the process, I get to know him a little bit more. It's going to take work. But if you've ever been through boot camp, boot camp is work. They don't call it a, a holiday inn. They don't call boot camp a place where you go for vacation. It's working in to learn how to work within the military. And guys, we need to learn how to walk and work within the military of God's kingdom. That intimacy that God wants to develop with us is going to release the kingdom, the power, the miracles, the spiritual understanding, the divine wisdom, and authority that we need in our lives. And what I don't think we, we understand fully. The Ancient of Days has all authority. He has all power. He has all wisdom. He has all knowledge. All of it. And when I get into fellowship with him, then I'm in a position to where I can draw from that knowledge. I draw from that authority and I draw from that power because I begin to be instruments of his righteousness in the earth. God wants to turn this to God and sons, but for for a a son and dad to work together, they got to know each other and they got to know the family business. That's what God's calling us to. And so what we need to begin expecting and begin to pray every day, Lord, take every man-made veil from before my eyes. Take it all away from me. I want to see you. I want to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to know you, and I want to know the power of your resurrection. I want to know that. In fact, the Apostle Paul went as far as he said, I count all my achievements, and, and Paul was wealthy before he was called to ministry. He was a very affluent family. They were able to, he, he was an aristocrat within, within, within Judea, Judea. He walked away from it all to know Jesus. And he said, and this is what he said, but he says, I counted nothing more than a dunghill. So God, my 52-inch TV, my new, I, what's it I have, and all these other things, I've got to count as nothing more than a dunghill that I set aside to know you, to get back in this word, to get back and to really know you. I want to know you intimately. I want to know this unknowable God that's been, been made knowable to a few that have surrendered to Jesus and tap into a kingdom that is never going to pass away, that can never be threatened, that can never be overcome by anything or anyone in the entire universe. That's what God's called us to do. And when we do that, we're going to start seeing answered prayers like never before. We're going to start seeing miracles. Our biggest problem 
from yours truly on over is that we have been presented the wrong God. And it's not connecting. Get back in the Word and discover the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I tie to that prophetic word that you gave me at the beginning of this. And Father, I loose an anointing and I command every scale the enemy has put over our eyes to fall off right now in the name of Jesus. I command any false veils to be rent in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask that we would be brought into deeper fellowship with you than we've ever dreamed possible. And Father, I claim it right now in Jesus' name. <laughs> 